All right, so some of you guys have heard uh, one of my kids was sick this week. Turns out he has COVID, um, but we didn't know that at the time. So when he's sick and he's feeling really bad at night, you know, he's, he's still pretty young. And so what we usually do is we let him go and sleep in the bed with mom, right? He wants to snuggle with her. He wants to feel protected. And so I get kicked out of my bed. Yes, so excited about that, right? All right, so I get kicked out of my bed. Now, where am I going to sleep? Well, our house is pretty full. There's a lot of people. Uh, most of all the rooms are full. I could go downstairs and sleep on the couch, I guess, but I don't like that too much. So usually I sleep in my youngest son's bed. And so that's what I was doing on these nights this week. I was going to sleep in his bed and here's how it went down. So first he goes and he goes to sleep. That's all good. Then his next older brother who shares a room with him goes to sleep. And so now it's time for me to go to bed. I'm at the end of a long day and I go up there and I don't want to wake up the one kid who's sleeping in there. So I don't want to turn on any lights. And that means it's really dark in that room. Now, here's the other problem with that room. Sometimes, just occasionally, it's maybe not as clean as would be ideal. And my kids really like to play with Legos. And so you can probably see where this is going. So I go walking into this room, right? Okay. Walking in, it's dark. I've, I'm kind of just barely turning on the screen of my cell phone to try and illuminate the floor. And oh, ah, man, step on a Lego. Oh, ah, another Lego. Boom, stub my toe on a Nerf gun. Oh my goodness. This is right before actually getting in bed. This is my final experience of the day is to beat my feet up with all the little toys and things that are on my kid's floor. Now, why did I stumble over those things? Because it was dark. When you're in the dark, you can't see. That's the thing about the dark. And so it's really easy to trip and fall. A lot, also, a lot of other things are easy. It's easy to get lost. Um, it's, easy to, it's easy for danger to come at you and you don't realize that that danger is coming. Maybe it's a Lego piece you're about to step on, but it might be something even worse coming at you in the dark. So all kinds of problems with the dark. Suffice it to say, when you're in the dark, you're trying to get somewhere in the dark, very often you don't have peace. That's what we're talking about today. This Sunday, part of Advent, we're focusing in on peace. We're in a series called Savior. We really need a Savior right now, don't we? We need to be saved from all the garbage in this world, and that is more obvious than it usually is because of all the circumstances in the world right now. The physical darkness, the isolation, the unknown, the danger that could come at us from unseen places. That's difficult. So what we're going to do today, actually, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture. These are traditional Christmas passages, and they are two of my very, very favorite. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, and then we're going to take a look at John chapter 1. And we're going to draw just a few things out of those. You'll see, if you don't already know, in those parts of the Bible, you will find strong imagery about darkness and light. You're also going to find the idea of the incarnation, that God became a human being. We're going to talk about why that's important, and we'll draw out a few lessons at the end just for our own lives. So what does it mean for us? How does it affect the way I live today? All right, so let's start off. We'll start off with Isaiah 9, and I'll just read it for you, and then we can talk about it some. So this Isaiah 9, this was written a long time. This is a long time before Jesus. And this section of Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet in Israel. And in this section, he is talking about a vision, a prophecy, knowledge that God has given him of what's going to happen in the future, in the future to him. And the prophecy in this particular section is about the Messiah, the one who is going to come and save the world. We know now that that person is Jesus. But listen to this whole section, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Isaiah 9, starting at verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun 
and the land of Naphtali. Don't worry about those. We'll get to it. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For because the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. <clears throat> there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this, will do all this. Wow, that is a powerful statement about what's going to happen to Isaiah who wrote it in the future. That's going to happen in the future when the Messiah would come. We now know, as I said, that Jesus, the man Jesus who was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth, who died on a cross, he is the Messiah. He is the one that Isaiah is talking about, the one that Isaiah was given information about ahead of time. All right, but let's go through it piece by piece. So it starts out talking about the place where the Messiah would be from. He will be from Galilee of the nations. The next thing that we see is also talks about light and darkness a whole bunch. So, so when he comes, it's going to be the end of several things. It's going to be, be the end of gloom for those who were in anguish. It's going to be a time of glory. There's going to be glory brought to the place that he grows up in, the place where he does his ministry. And then it opens up um, the, the further section in verse 2, with this line, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. So at this point, Isaiah hasn't yet told us what's going to come. He said that this land is going to be honored. Okay, got that. That gloom is going to be over. There's going to be no more gloom or distress for all these people who were, who were oppressed and having awful stuff happen to them. And now he says there's going to be a great light that comes. But he hasn't yet said what, what's the nature of that light. Uh, like, what is it? is it? Is this a physical light? Is it, is it knowledge that's going to be given to human beings? What exactly is this light? But we know that it's very great. So a great light will come those on those who dwell in the land of deep darkness. So the whole world is being described as a land of darkness. Just like we talked about earlier, that image we can use, my kid's bedroom with Legos on the floor, very small dangers. But the whole world here is being described as a land of deep darkness. You can't see anything. That's what this world is like. You can't see anything. You can't see where, in fact, you're going. There could be dangers coming at you that you never see until they hit you full force. It's a land, the world of deep darkness is a place of despair. It's a place of hopelessness. But the great news that Isaiah is telling us here is that a light was sent or would be sent into the world. That light, of course, now has come. What does he tell us next? Well, it's going to bring great joy. Well, yeah, if, if people, if you're living in a land of deep darkness and light shows up, one of the reactions you might have 
is incredible joy. Finally, somebody turned the lights on. We'll see other reactions as well. Next, in verses 4 and in verse 5, we see that oppression is going to end. So no more are people going to be stuck, controlled, uh, forced uh, into bad situations. Uh, no, all the bad stuff is going to be destroyed by the coming of this one, including war itself. And that shows us something about, in a minute we'll get to peace, right? Because this is going to talk about, it's going to describe him as the Prince of Peace. But this, this should show us that the peace that's going to be brought by this light is very different than the peace that is offered by this world. In the ancient world, it was really clear, how do you achieve peace? Well, by war. What peace means is that some king has conquered everything, has defeated all the other kings, he's put people into subjection, he's oppressed them, and so now there's peace, because only the will of one person is being done, the king, right? But somehow, this light that's going to come, this Messiah, in fact, that's going to come, is going to both end oppression, he's going to end oppression, and he's going to bring peace, he's going to end war. So both of these things, this seemed impossible in the ancient world, right? That someone could end oppression. If you end oppression, what you end up with is chaos. You don't have peace. What you have to do to reach peace is you have war. You constantly use violence to make sure that everybody's, nobody's fighting with each other, nobody's fighting with the government. But in this case, some different kind of rule is coming. This light is going to bring peace without war and without oppression. This is remarkable. All right, so moving down to verse 6, we see that this light that's going to come into the world, that will somehow bring peace without oppression and without war, this light is actually a person. It's not just knowledge. It's not an event that's going to happen. It is a human being who will come into the world. In verse 6, we have this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. This is, in fact, what we remember at Christmas, a particular child being born, a child who would change everything. Now, when we get to the second half of verse 6 and into verse 7, we see a number of remarkable things said about this particular human being. Okay, number one, the government will be upon his shoulder. The government. So he's going to rule. Well, that's not all that unusual, right? Many kings have ruled in the world. Often an emperor would be viewed as the one who could, who could hold everything up. But this will be a great king, a great ruler. And he will have the ability to carry the weight of ruling everything. That's very important. How many of our current or past political leaders do you really trust, do you think are fully competent, they are able to carry that massive responsibility that they have. Yeah, I don't think any of us, I don't think any of them, not only any of them, but any human being in the world today is competent to do that, to carry the weight of governing the human race. But here in Isaiah chapter 9, we see that the Messiah, when he will come, this one will be able to carry the weight of the government of the world on his shoulders. And then we have four names given to this child. The first one, Wonderful Counselor. So he's going to be insanely wise, insanely intelligent. He's going to actually know how to do things the right way. That's very important. The second one, and this second one is, to me, the most remarkable of all. It says that his name will be Mighty God. Now, why is that so remarkable? You are talking about here a text that was written by Isaiah, by a Jewish prophet. In the Old Testament, it is very clear, there is only one God. The Lord your God is the only God. Worship and serve Him alone. Serve Him only. A huge part of the Old Testament is directed against all these kings and emperors uh, who styled themselves as gods. Oh, I'm the king of Babylon. I am a god. Worship me. Whatever it was. The king of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt. 
And so the Old Testament is very much against this idea of human beings pretending to be God. In fact, that's one of its main points. Yet right here, we have the statement that the Messiah, when He comes, His name, His proper name, will be Mighty God. In some way, this human being who's going to be born will also be God. All right, moving on, he's called Everlasting Father. And then finally, he's called the Prince of Peace. He's the ruler who brings peace, but again, not the kind of peace that this world brings. A kind of peace that doesn't oppress in order to achieve its goal, but a kind of peace that sets human beings free. Now, it's hard for us even to imagine what that would be like. The next verse tells us a little bit more, and in this, in verse 7, we see what kind of a government he will have, or we start to get a glimpse of it anyway, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. What does that mean? This might be actually my favorite verse in the whole section in Isaiah 9. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. He will begin to rule the world. This paints a picture of the Messiah coming not as this conqueror who dominates everyone and physically destroys his enemies, but we can see it prefigures what's going to happen with Jesus, that he would be one who comes and conquers not cities and nations and governments, but human hearts. He'll begin to rule in certain places. It doesn't say where he's going to rule in the beginning, but he'll begin to rule some places. And then, as time goes on, his rule, the amount of the number of human beings, the amount of this world that he is governing will only always increase. It will only grow. And this is exactly what we have seen in Jesus. I mean, he's, here's this guy, he, he wanders around Galilee for a while, he does some amazing things, he dies on the cross, okay, and he rises from the dead, but only a small number of people actually see that. You know, even after he's, he's risen from the dead and shown himself to a number of people, maybe 500 people in the world are his followers at that point, maybe less. But since that time, the number of people choosing to follow him Choosing to give him their lives has only always increased. And it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what goes on in the news. It doesn't matter what goes on with politics. It doesn't matter where there's, whether there's wars or diseases or natural disasters. You can be absolutely certain of this. The government of Jesus, the number of people following after him in his rule of this world will only always increase not by force, but by something much more powerful, because he is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, I hope you've gotten something out of that. The point you can write down for this first section of the message today is this, light brings peace. The light that would come into the world brings peace, and that happens in a different way than the way that this world gives peace. All right, we'll continue talking about that some more by jumping into John chapter 1. But first, we need to have a little bit of background for John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is going to open up with a big, crazy word. And in English, the word is word, right? So, in the beginning was the word. That's how this section is going to open up when we read it. In the Greek language that this was first written in, the word there is logos. Now, what in the world is the Logos? There's a lot of confusion about that. So let's talk for a minute about uh, this book, John, and who wrote it, and why he was writing it, and the culture, and all of this stuff. Okay, here we go. So John was writing this book into a culture that this idea of the Logos was a very, very common thing to talk about. It came originally from Greek philosophy. The easiest way to get at this, what is the Logos, the easiest way to think about it for us is to think about in our culture how people talk about a higher power. A higher power, or maybe they talk about the universe, 
or some people even talk about you know, energy, spiritual energy. There is a desire to talk about in our culture, um, to talk about some force or principle or something that created the world. When human beings are outside in nature, for example, when we're in nature and we see you know, the beauty of everything that exists, it is very hard for us to resist the truth that it was created. It was designed. In fact, we want to thank someone for it. And so very often we're talking about, well, there must be some sort of higher power or, uh, you know, the universe in our culture talking about uh, that, that the universe has ordered things so well. With COVID, there have been, I've heard statements, public statements that say things like, your body was designed to defeat viruses. <laughs> designed by whom? Well, sometimes evolution is placed in there, but evolution is not something, to design something, you have to have a will, you have to have, you have to have intention. In fact, to design something, you have to be a person or have a personality. So it's very interesting that our culture talks about it this way. Now, the motivation for talking about a higher power or talking about energy or design from evolution or the universe rather than talking about God. The motivation for that is that it's safer, or at least it feels safer for us. Right? If I say that, if I say that I was designed by God, or that the world was designed by God, well, I've implied a lot of things with that statement. God is probably a person in that case. He, God has desires, He has plans, He has intentions for the world, and that means there might be things that I should or shouldn't do. God might have requirements for me. But if I think of whatever made all of this, the greatness of this world, if I think of it just as a higher power, I don't give any sort of personality to it. Or I think of it just as, you know, a force or the universe. Well, then that has no claim on what I should do. In that case, I can still be my own, be my own master. I can still be in charge of my own life. And so this is the motivation, I think, for our culture, uh, not talking about God, but talking about a higher power. And this is very similar. <laughs> in fact, I might just say it's the exact same thing as what happened in the ancient world, especially with the ancient Greeks and then the Romans following their lead. So if you go back to some famous Greek philosophers, like, like let's take the most famous ones, right? You've probably heard of Socrates. You probably heard of Plato. You probably heard of Aristotle. All of these guys had a very similar idea. They looked at the world and they said, you know, uh, there's got to be some reason for all of this. We see order in the world, in the way that life exists, in the way that the, the, the solar system is set up and planets move in the heavens. And we see order in, in the way that the weather happens. There must be some reason for it. And even Plato went as far as to say, we see, we see things in the world around us, and then we also have an idea that they should be better than they are. Where does that idea come from? And so what these guys said is there must be something out there. There must be something that's invisible, it's in some sort of spiritual realm that is responsible for creating this world. And it's also the thing that we're all trying to aspire to be like or to to make things more like. It's sort of these ideals that are out there. Okay, and so these great philosophers, they have this idea that something must have created all the order and goodness that we see in the world. But their idea was that it was some kind of impersonal force out there. It's not like a being. It's not something with a mind or that wants things or plans things, but it's some impersonal force. And following that, you have, you have the Stoics, uh, you have what's, what are called the Neoplatonists, and for hundreds and hundreds of years, they taught this philosophy. Now, one of the words that they used, especially the Neoplatonists later on, is this word, logos. So what's going on in John chapter 1 is that John is saying something that will shatter, it will shatter the ideas of the culture that he's speaking into. What he's saying is so deep and radical, it must have been difficult for people who read it at first even to understand what he meant. Because he is saying 
that the Logos became a human being. All right, here we go. In the beginning was the higher power, the Word, the Logos. And the higher power was with God. And the higher power was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so the word, the higher power, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks above me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. All right, so he begins off with things that his culture would think are, are very normal. This is how they would normally understand the higher power, the Logos. So the higher power was from the very beginning. That's right. So that's what all the philosophers taught. The higher power, in fact, was with God. Well, okay, uh, not everybody in their culture believed in God the way that the Bible talks about him, but uh, if there was a God, okay, then the higher power would be with God somehow. And the higher power was God. Now, this might have made some people think for a minute. Now, he's combining two ideas. Remember, the whole point of talking about a higher power, I am suggesting the whole point is that then you don't have to talk about God right? So if there's no God, then there's no demands on your life. The higher power doesn't make any demands on my life. The Logos doesn't make any demands. So, but now we're talking about both. We're talking about the higher power and we're talking about God. What's going on here? Okay, next in verse 3, everything was made through this higher power. Well, that's exactly what the philosophers taught. So no big deal there. That's normal. That's what they expect. Uh, in the, the Logos, in the higher power was life. Yes, he's the source of all life. And that life was the light of human beings, was the light of men. Okay, so that would have been something that his culture would have agree agreed with. The higher power is the source of all knowledge. It's the source of knowing how to live in this life. Good, okay. We see this is connected to Isaiah chapter 9 as well, right? So similar imagery, light in the darkness, and then verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, here's something that would have started to seem strange, right? So, the light is doing something in this instance. It is trying to drive back the darkness. Well, things that are impersonal forces don't do things, at least not with any intention. 
Next, he talks about John as a man who was sent from God. We're going to skip over that part a little bit. Verse 9, he says, the true light, the light that gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now, this is where John starts to pull out the big guns, things that his culture could not understand when they first heard them. The higher power, this light that's going to come, that that illuminates the whole world as the light of men, it's going to show up. It's going to come into the world. In fact, most of the philosophers we talked about earlier would have said that was an absolute impossibility. This physical world is ruined. It can't be saved. It's death and decay. The higher power is is perfect. It's good. It's in some other realm, and it could never connect with the, the broken darkness of this world. And yet John says, it did. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. What a powerful image that is. The higher power shows up in the world, and he's walking around as a human being, among human beings. And then in verse 12, we see that he shows up in the world to do something. In fact, to do something very powerful and remarkable. To anyone who receives him. Most of the world is going to reject him, but to anyone who receives him, he's going to give the right to become children of God. He's going to give the ability for them to be born all over again, not physically reborn, but spiritually reborn, to have a whole new life. We can think back to our darkness and light imagery from before, right? So when the light comes in, If you've been in a dark place for a long time, it might be the case, it will be the case for some people that when you turn on the light, there will be great joy. We saw that in Isaiah chapter 9, great joy. Finally, the light is here. But the other thing that might happen is that people might resist the light. First of all, they're used to the darkness. The light is going to hurt our eyes at first. And if we don't recognize it as anything good, we might just want it to go away, like you do sometimes when someone turns on the light and you've been sleeping. You just want that light to go away. But the other thing is the light is going to show the world for what it really is. And I think that is the scariest thing. Men, human beings, loved darkness. Why? Because the things that they did were evil. The things that we did, that we do, are wrong. And when the light of God shows up in our life, in our world today, it shows those things for what they are. This is kind of like, again, imagine my kids with the Legos, right? You could imagine if I'm stepping on on the Legos. Now, my kids are asleep, so let's just imagine for a minute that they're not. I'm stepping on the Legos. I'm hurting my toes. They might say, no, 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 you're not stepping on Legos. No, it's, it's something else. I didn't leave anything there. No way. And as long as it's dark, I can't prove what's true about that situation, right? It might be that it's not a Lego and it just seems like it to me. Or they could say, hey, it's it's not my Lego. (laughs) It's not my Lego that you stepped on, Dad. It's my brother's Lego. Well, we can't see that until we turn on the lights. And in this dark world where we've been living without light for so long, Many of us have constructed entire ways of living that are based on things that are false. They're based on things that are not true. They're, in fact, based on lies. And so, if that's the case, if our whole life is constructed on ideas that turn out not to be true, light can be very threatening because it's going to show something that we don't want to be true. All right, so what are we going to do with this message today? We've looked at Isaiah chapter 9, the ideas of light and darkness and the Prince of Peace. We've said that His government will come, it's begun, and it will only always increase. We've looked at John chapter 1. We've looked at this, this idea of a higher power and how that higher power is not just some impersonal force. The higher power is God, a person. A person, a God who came into this world, the world that He created, He entered it because it was broken and dark. 
He entered it and became a human being and lived with us in all of this same mess that we experience today. Now, here's the great news that we can take away out of John chapter 1. If you want more peace in your life, if you're feeling like, okay, he said he was going to come and bring peace. He's the prince of peace. Well, where is it? This world seems like it's a mess. My life feels like it's a mess. It's stress and darkness and gloom. If that's how you feel to whatever degree, the great news is that John tells us that his government, the government of God, and his peace are available right now to anyone who's willing to receive them, to anyone who's willing to receive Him. To those who are willing to receive Him, He gives the right to become children of God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, He is able to deal with all the mess, all the wrong stuff that you've done, and all the darkness and blindness in your life, he's able to deal with it and bring you into a restored relationship with God. And that is the only source, the only source of real peace in this life. Jesus, before he left his disciples, one of the things that he said to them was this, my peace I give to you. He said, I'm not giving you peace the way that this world tries to give you peace. What did he mean? He meant that his peace is for real. He knows how to accomplish it in you. He knows how to give peace that will last and won't just evaporate. He knows how to bring peace without force, without violence, without oppression. He knows how to bring lasting, real peace to human lives, and he will give it to you. All you got to do is reach out to him. Receive him. He came down into this world as a powerful light. And the problem with that is a lot of people ran away from him. They kept on looking at the things that they were used to looking at, things in the darkness. They didn't want to look at the light. It was too bright. We got to look. We got to go after him. We got to pay attention to him, reach out to him, seek him, and he will allow you to find him. That's the only source of peace that we can have in this life. And it is so much better than any other thing that there is. I mean, this is, this is the message we bring again and again, but especially at Christmas. Go after God. Go after Him. He is here right now. He is ready to increase His rule, His government in your life. And that is the thing you should want the most. If God is ruling in your life and you're trusting Him and following Him, you can walk through anything and experience His peace. This is the message of Christmas. Let's pray and we'll continue in worship. Father God, we thank you so much for not leaving us alone in this dark world. Thank you that that you are a person who listens to us hears our prayers, cares about what we want, not just some impersonal force. Thank you for creating this world and thank you for the light that you bring. Thank you for coming, coming into this world as a human being and then dying, suffering and dying so that we could be set free. Set free to live a life of peace with you. And God, we pray again and again bring more people to that place. Wake us up from the darkness and turn us back toward your light. We pray that that would be one of the things that's accomplished by your power this Christmas. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.